actually really excited to talk about bioluminescence. It's a really fascinating subject. And as you can see from a lot of these pictures here, and just even this guy right here, we're going to talk about a lot of really cool animals probably didn't even know exist, and actually most people probably don't know exist, and I've got some little movie clips of things that really you're going to be probably some of the few people in the entire world to ever see some of these creatures because they're so hard to study down in the deep sea. I also have to start out by saying too that I'm sort of a molecular biologist and microbiologist sort of masquerading as a marine biologist. Um, I did start out doing microbiology and molecular biology, and it was the molecular biology that got me into studying these. Um, I am from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. I just want to briefly tell you um, where I'm from and what we are. We're in Moss Landing, um, California. Um, here is the Research Institute right here um, on the water of Monterey Bay. And yeah, all that white stuff is from the seagulls <laughs> on top of our roof. And we have uh, three research ves vessels that you can see there. Now, why are we in Moss Landing? This is the Monterey Bay. This is Santa Cruz. This is Monterey, where the Monterey Bay Aquarium is. Even though we're called the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, we're not the aquarium. We are, were originally started by the aquarium. We're a private, nonprofit oceanographic research institute that was started by David Packard from Hewlett Packard. And we are funded by the Packard Foundation to the tune of about $30 million a year. Extremely generous of them. Um, and we are located here at Moss Landing. If you've ever been down Highway 1 and seen the large sm um, stacks from the power plant, that's right where we are. And this is an underwater map coming out from the Monterey Bay. And from this, you can tell why we're in Moss Landing. This is the Monterey Bay Canyon. It's almost, it's over 11,000 feet deep, and it's 95 miles long. And it's very close into shore. So we can get to very deep water in a very short time from Moss Landing. So this really makes it an ideal way to study deep sea animals. Um, most other places offshore, you have to go for quite a long distance before you'll find any kind of water this deep. We can go out in the morning, go do research in deep water, and still be back in the afternoon to go home at night. We have three ships. Um, and these are the ships that we do most of our research off of. Uh, the Western Flyer does multi-day trips. The Point Lobos does day trips mostly. And the Zephyr also does a lot of day trips. And these, these two ships have the remotely operated vehicles that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. And that's one of the great tools that we use um, to study these deep sea animals. They're um, submersibles that we operate from the ship. I work in the Haddock Lab. I work with Dr. Stephen Haddock, and he's one of the basically one of the world experts on bioluminescence in the ocean. And we study the molecular and morphological diversity of deep sea zooplankton, which these things are all zooplankton. And we clone and characterize proteins important for bioluminescence and fluorescence in a number of different groups, but mainly tenophores, which are comb jellies, cnidarians, uh, which contain siphonophores and the classic jellyfish and these wonderful little radiolarians, which these are not to scale. This is a really big animal. This is a really small animal. So let's start out first by talking about what bioluminescence is. Bioluminescence is very simply light made by living animals. But it's a form of chemiluminescence. And it's the result of a chemical reaction. So there is an enzyme-mediated media, uh, oxidation of a substrate, and the energy that's released from that substrate is released as photons, and that's what makes the light. And a vast majority of the luminous animals live in the ocean, which sort of makes sense. When you think about the deep sea, it's this big, huge ecosystem, and for the most part, it's pretty dark. The upper layers, um, some light can penetrate through, but once you get, you know, a thousand meters down, it's pretty dim, and so that's really a great place for something like bioluminescence to evolve. Common examples that usually people have seen um, examples of bioluminescence would be, of course, the, the classic firefly. We don't have those in California, but if you've come from somewhere else, you may have seen fireflies. And of course, the famous glowworms of New Zealand, um, which are actually a little fungus gnat that the larvae are bioluminescent. They glow, and they sit on uh, the walls in caves or on canyons, and they have these little mucus strings that hang down, and they glow, and they attract little insects that get stuck in the little mucus strings, and then they eat everything off the little mucus string. And I actually was uh, fortunate enough to see some uh, glowworms. I was in New Zealand once with um, 
this crazy Kiwi friend of mine who may or may not be in the room right now. And she actually uh, took us out um, <laughs> to uh, some friends, uh, hiked us out actually to this great little canyon. And we went out there in the middle of the night with our flashlights. And there were all these little glowing animals. And it was interesting because that sort of foreshadowed what I would do later because I wasn't working at bio on bioluminescence at the time. The most, probably the most likely form of bioluminescence most people see is the one that's caused by dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates are the ones that make the ocean sort of glow. Sometimes people may have been out on a boat and they saw the wake of the boat at night sort of glowing, or they might see this is actually a wave crashing on a beach. And sometimes you'll see the waves crashing and they'll light up a little bit. And those are caused, caused by little dinoflagellates which are little single-celled organisms. They're um, the animals that are responsible for red tides. You may have heard of red tides. And actually, in that previous picture, the red in front was actually a red tide. Um, many of them are photosynthetic. Some of them are heterotrophic, meaning that they eat other organisms. But a lot of them are photosynthetic. And they produce short bursts of light from a mechanical stimulation, so that wave crashing or that boat going through um, the water. And we think that they use that as sort of a burglar alarm to attract predators to the animals that are eating them. So if something is grazing on them, they make these little flashes of light. The bigger animals say, hey, what's that light? They go over there, and then they eat the larger animals that are eating them. But you'll see as I go through here, when we start talking about functions, a lot of times I'm going to say, we think this is why it does it. Because you know we're not 100% sure why some of these animals bioluminesce. But I think you'll see as we go along, you'll be very impressed with um, the bioluminescence of a lot of these animals. There are a lot, well, there are some uh, non-marine animals that glow, as we said, fireflies, glowworms. There are some fungi. You can see some glowing fungi here. There are some earthworms. There is only one freshwater animal that bioluminesces. However, in the deep sea, over 90% of the animals bioluminesce. And I think most people don't realize that. And here are some examples of the diversity of animals that do bioluminesce, sort of starting with the small, the dinoflagellates that I already talked about, these single-celled organisms, bacteria, of course. Here's actually a plate with some Vibrio streaked down on it. Do you guys do anything with yeah. glowing Vibrio? Mm -hmm. The radiolarians, which are protease, these small uh, colonial animals. And they sort of glow all over. Tenophores. This is the phylum Tenophora. Um, these are more commonly known as comb jellies. Come in a variety of different sizes and shapes and colors. These are gelatinous animals, so they're squishy like a jellyfish. And I just have to show you this, because these animals are just truly amazing. This is Lampetius. It's a comb jelly. Comb jellies have eight rows of combs. Everyone has eight rows. And they, they beat them. They're modified cilia, and they beat them. And that's what propels them through the water. And their bioluminescence is usually sort of all over the place in some of these little canals that they have. This picture was actually taken from one of our uh, remotely operated vehicles. Other groups that bioluminesce, of course, are jellyfish, cnidarians. And actually, people who study jellyfish don't call them jellyfish. We usually call them jellies or medusa. And siphonophores which is another group of um, cnidarians that have these long tentacles. They basically put out these big sheets of tentacles sometimes and just fish. They sit out there with this big stinging net. And siphonophores are actually some of the longest animals in the, in the world, actually, longer than, um, than whales. They can just, they're very thin and delicate, but they can be quite long. And here's some other little medusae. And of course, fish. You probably can't see this guy very well. There's a fish with a lot of teeth with a little glowing barbel. The angler fish is like sort of the fish poster child for bioluminescence. He's the one who has that little glowing barbel on top of his head. And then other fish which have bioluminescence underneath them. And this is um, a good example of a bioluminescent fish. This is a dragonfish. And if you see all these little dots down here, those are all photophores. Those are all little organs that contain bioluminescent material. This was another picture taken from an ROV. So that was taken in the wild, in the ocean. Other groups that bioluminesce in the ocean are annelids, worms. These are polychaete worms. Um, Tomopterus, which is really this gorgeous color. Um, this, these guys here um, we call green bombers. They have 
little balls of bioluminescence. You can see some of them there. And when you startle them, they drop these little bombs, these little bioluminescent bombs. And this guy is affectionately known as pig butt. Um, the researchers who discovered it nicknamed it pig butt. And it's actually a worm um, that has sort of more of a larval shape to it. And its real name, its actual scientific name is Ketopterus pugiporcinus, which means rump of a pig. So they actually named it that. And of course, mollusk squid. I think a lot of people are familiar with squid, this really cute little um, Hawaiian bobtail squid, Euprimna, which actually has bioluminescent bacteria, um, a histiotuthis, and vampiratuthis, the vampire squid. And I have some good footage of that guy to show you. And crustaceans. They're usually pretty little. They're sort of like the insects of the sea. This is Gaussia. He spurts out clouds of bioluminescence when he's startled. And this is Euphausia. This is krill. So the krill that, you know, big whales eat and everything. And he has little bioluminescent organs underneath him. And ketignaths, also known as arrowworms, they are actually their own phylum. And you probably really can't read this, but this is just sort of for illustration. This is a tree of life. And Bacteria and archaea are up here, and these are all the different animal groups. All the blue ones are groups that contain uh, marine bioluminescent animals, and the green ones are terrestrial uh, bioluminescent animals. And you can see from looking at this that basically almost every single group has something in it that bioluminesces. The notable exceptions are mammals, reptiles, birds, amphibians, and flowering plants. No known um, species of those in those groups that bioluminesce. So we don't bioluminesce. I don't know why. It would be really cool if we did. <laughs> so let's get into actually um, a little bit of the chemistry. And this is as deep as the chemistry is going to go for the most part. Um, how does bioluminescence actually work? There are two components to bioluminescence, a luciferin and a luciferase. The luciferase is the enzyme that catalyzes an oxidation of this substrate. So the luciferin, the substrate along with oxygen, is converted to an oxyluciferin, and the result of that reaction is energy that's released as light. In most cases, um, you need to bring in then a fresh molecule of luciferin to be, re to be oxidized again to continue to produce the light. So usually once this guy's oxidized, it's done. Now that's when there's a separate luciferin and luciferase. In some animals, the luciferin and the luciferase are together in one molecule, and those are called photoproteins. And many, many of the animals actually have photoproteins. Um, I think many people mistakenly think that most bioluminescence is caused by bacteria, and that's not true. Most animals in the deep sea actually have their own bioluminescent proteins. And so in this case, this is a cute little cartoon here, where the luciferin is together um, with the luciferase, and the oxygen. And in this case, it's, out, it's activated by calcium. So calcium is brought into the system, and that triggers the reaction. Um, and so these animals somehow control how they have the, their luciferin and their luciferase together already. And they somehow control allowing calcium to come into the system to trigger the bioluminescence. And in this as well, you need to replace, replenish the luciferin. Um, this photoprotein can probably um, work again. You just need to replace the oxyluciferin with a fresh luciferin for the reaction to continue. Is there a sense of how well, that has evolved? It is thought, which is actually a point that I was going to make on this slide, um, it is thought that bioluminescence has evolved multiple times, mm -hmm. that all these multiple animals have actually evolved it independently. Um, and the reason that we think that is that um, the luciferases, the enzyme that actually does the oxidation, they're quite varied from one animal to another. I mean, they actually can be very different. If you're trying to just do a search of, of nucleotide sequence, they're very difficult to find from one to another because they are quite different. But there are very few luciferins, very few substrate. And um, selenorazine here is the most common substrate used in marine animals. And most animals actually don't produce their own selenorazine. It's thought that they get it from their diet. So some of those, maybe those small copepods, um, some of those animals are probably making the selenorazine, and the jellyfish and those things are eating them, taking up the selenorazine, and then using it for their own bioluminescence. 
So it's thought that perhaps there's just this substrate out there that was readily available. And so many different animals have then independently evolved a way of, you, of turning that into light. Um, and you can see here that actually these are, are fairly varied too. The dinoflagellates that I talked about in the beginning, um, it's thought that their luciferin is actually derived from chlorophyll. Uh, bacteria have their own. Uh, Vibrio, um, which of course is the, the um, one that I showed earlier. Um, Firefly, um, they're all fairly different, but there's pretty much a limited number of these compared to the vast array of photoproteins and luciferases. And a lot of this information that I'm, that I'm showing you is from the Bioluminescence webpage, which is actually a webpage maintained by my boss, Dr. Stephen Haddock. Um, and if you Google Bioluminescence, this is probably the first hit you'll get, and it has so much information in it. Bioluminescence is blue to blue-green light. And we know that, that, um, that it's the wavelength of light that determines the color. Um, so it usually tends to be between 450 and 510, blue and shifting to blue-green. And that is the wavelength that transmits the best in the ocean. If it's a little bit shorter or a little bit longer, it tends to either be scattered or absorbed. So it sort of makes sense that that is the wavelength um, that would be admitted. And that is determined pretty much by the luciferase or the photoprotein itself. Um, but there's not much very, I mean, it, is, it does pretty much stay within that narrow range. So let's talk about what isn't bioluminescence, because it's kind of confusing. Um, and even textbooks will get this wrong a lot. So bioluminescence is not diffraction or iridescence. So this is one of those comb jellies, and you can see that light is diffracting off of these comb rows and giving you these, this kind of a prism effect, giving you these beautiful rainbow colors. That is not bioluminescence. And here, this is some iridescence off this jelly. And that is just um, light reflecting off of the multiple layers of this jelly. This animal is actually not bioluminescent at all. This one is, and I'll actually show you what the bioluminescence looks like on this guy later. Many textbooks will actually show you this picture and say that this animal is bioluminescing. Um, so just be on the lookout for that. Also, what is not bioluminescence? Phosphorescence. Phosphorescence is like those glow-in-the-dark stickers that you expose to light and then they glow for quite a while afterwards. Because those require an external source of light. So that you shine a light on it, that's absorbed, and then it's re-emitted sort of slowly over time. And remember, bioluminescence is the generation of light. You start with no light, you have a chemical reaction, and then there's light. This one requires light in order to work. Fluorescence is also not bioluminescence. Fluorescence, again, requires an external source of light, and it's absorbed and it's re-emitted at a longer wavelength. This is Coriolanus. It's the strawberry anemone that's very common along the California coast. This is under visible light, and this is it fluorescing, and I mean, look how beautiful that is. And you can see that it's only fluorescing in very specific places. This animal is not bioluminescent, but it is definitely fluorescent. And the fluorescence is actually caused by um, fluorescent proteins that come in different colors, and I actually have a little tube that you may not be able to see. I don't know if you can see the super bright pink. This is actually a fluorescent protein that's been cloned from one of these um, Coriolanus, and we expressed it in bacteria. Fluorescence is important, though, because a lot of bioluminescent animals have fluorescence as well. And if you think about it, that sort of makes sense. I just said that bioluminescence is the generation of light, the creation of light, and that fluorescence actually requires input light. So you can see that if you're making the light with bioluminescence, you can then use that light in a fluorescent reaction. So if you're starting sort of in this blue-green area, you can run that bioluminescent light then through a, a fluorescent substrate, and then you can shift it and make it green, yellow, orange, red, and here's a really good example of this. Acoria victoria. This is the jellyfish where the very famous green fluorescent protein comes from. I don't know if you guys are familiar with green fluorescent proteins. Um, and this organism contains a calcium-activated photoprotein, but it's also linked to a green fluorescent protein 
GFP is used as a cellular marker. It's a very, very common marker um, that sort of revolutionized a lot of cellular biology. And you can take the gene for GFP and you can link it onto your gene of interest. And then it will express your protein with this green fluorescent protein stuck on the end. And wherever that protein goes in the cell, you can shine a light on it and it will fluoresce and you can see where it is. And it's really, um, really pretty amazing what you can do with it. And it's such an amazing thing that last year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to the people who first discovered and then developed um, green fluorescent protein as a cellular marker. Now, Acoria victoria is probably the most famous bioluminescent and fluorescent jellyfish, but it's probably the most misunderstood, and this is definitely where you're going to see pictures that are incorrect. This jelly does not fluoresce, does not bioluminesce and fluoresce all over it. A lot of times you're going to see pictures of this and they're going to color it green and they're going to say, here it is, bioluminescing and fluorescing. This guy actually only fluoresces around the margin of its bell. So if you looked up at it, this is the only place where it has green fluorescent protein and bioluminescence and it's in these little, see these little things around the bell margin. So now you know, the next time you see a, big, a picture of that organism and it's all glowing green, you'll even see it in textbooks and you'll know that it's wrong. Now, how do we study bioluminescence? A lot of these animals are in the deep sea, very difficult to study. Traditionally, these animals have been collected in trawls. Um, trawls are really, really hard on these animals, especially the little delicate ones. Here's a trawl net. You can see how long they are. And this is tossed off the side of the boat. It's opened up and it's dragged behind the ship. And all the things collect in the end of it. So everything just gets sort of jammed in in the end. You pull it up and you kind of throw it all out onto a, into a big tray. And the gelatinous animals are really in pretty bad shape by the time they come up. Some other animals are OK, but it makes it very difficult to study something if it's in pieces when it comes back up. Blue water diving is actually an excellent way to collect organisms. Um, and it's just like what it sounds. Scuba divers um, descend, and they're attached to this trapeze thing here. Everybody's um, connected to it because it's very easy to lose your orientation when you're out there um, with no top, no bottom, no, no frame of reference at all. So they tether themselves to these and then they have little jars and they swim around and they see a little comb jelly go by and they put it in their jar and they put the lid on it and they stick it in their little mesh bag. And that's really good for collecting animals. I mean, they come up alive, they're beautiful, they're really good to study then. But this still obviously is going to be limited to how deep a diver can dive. What we use a lot of at Embari are remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs. This is a very complicated picture just showing you how complicated they are. These are unmanned submersibles that are tethered to the ship and power and um, information goes back and forth across the tether. They have huge lights, they have high definition cameras, and they even have little samplers. So this is a little suction sampler that we find an animal we want, we push the suction sampler out, we turn on the suction and we suck it up and put it in a little bucket that's contained back here. And these are called detritus samplers and they're basically little tubes that have top and bottom that open. And these amazing pilots will take this big huge thing like this with these big samplers and they'll, they'll put it over some little animal that's maybe this big in the water. They'll put it over there, they'll lower it over the top and close the top and the bottom. And then we can bring those up to the surface and the animals are alive and intact in really excellent shape. And so we sit in a control room on the ship controlling. We have pilots who fly the ROV and we look through the camera and we tell the pilots what we want to look at, what we want to film, and what we want to collect. And here's a picture of a, squid, a very angry squid. This is not a happy squid. He's squirting out his ink. Some squid actually also squirt out bioluminescence. Um, as a way to evade predators. And here's that suction sample. They're going to try to stick it in there. Squid are hard because they're fast. And if you're trying to get it in that bucket and you touch the end, they'll take off. Not all squid, but most squid. So what is the function of all this bioluminescence? Well, there are definitely some functions that we can identify. Some of it is attraction. They have those fluorescent or bioluminescent lures that they hang out. Some, it's to escape from predation. Some animals use it for communication. Certainly fireflies use it for communication. They have certain little flashes that they do to one another. Um, jellyfish are not, are not visual animals. They don't have eyes, and we don't see any way that they can actually detect light. So it's 
probably not the case that jellyfish are communicating to one another um, with bioluminescence. Some fish actually use it for illumination. They want to illuminate something. And some of them, well, we're not exactly sure why they're doing it. Um, but obviously, if it's been maintained for however many thousands of years, it's got to be doing something for them. So let's start with some small animals and work ourselves up to some larger animals. And I'm just going to show you some examples of different animals that bioluminesce. And we can talk about functions, because some animals actually use bioluminescence for more than one thing. So let's start with bacteria. There is a phenomenon called milky seas. And these are nocturnal displays of a sustained glowing sea surface. And this is not the same as those, um, the dinoflagellates that will maybe just light up the wake of the boat or something like that. These are long, sustained patches that people describe their boat going through for maybe several days. They'll be in uh, bioluminescent seas. Um, and there were some researchers who wanted to know, could we actually see bioluminescence from a satellite? Could we actually get that data from satellite data? So they went through, and they looked through all a bunch of ship logs. I think they went on the internet and just Googled them all or something. And they found one report from 1995 um, from a ship's log that was in the Indian Ocean. This is Africa. And you can see how huge this is. And in the log, it said, it appeared as though the ship was sailing over a field of snow or gliding over the clouds. Must have been amazing. They said it was from horizon to horizon. For three days, for three nights, they sailed through bioluminescent seas. So they looked at the location that this was taken, and they looked at that, um, the data from the satellite in that location, and they had to do some filtering and some different you know, things to the data um, to see if they could get it. And finally, they saw this patch, and it matched exactly to the location that the ship was in. So yes, you can actually see it from a satellite if you know it's there, and you're looking really hard, and you manipulate the data until you can finally enhance it so it comes out. So what is causing this? Since the emitted light is constant, it must be bacterial. Um, so chances are, although whoever went through that patch didn't sample it, it's mo more than likely Vibrio harvii, which is probably the organism that you guys grow up, possibly in association with an algae. Um, this is a glowing flask of Vibrio harvii. Why does it bioluminesce? Well, there are some uh, reports that say that they seem to, the, the bacteria that glow seem to have less UV damage to their DNA. So perhaps that's the function. But what controls this? And, why, and how does it start bioluminescing? Well, there's another organism as well, another Vibrio that also uh, bioluminesces, and that's Vibrio fisheri. And this is the one that lives in a symbiotic association with different hosts such as this really cute bobtail um, squid from Hawaii, and also several fish. These animals have a specialized light organ that has a pure culture of Vibrio. And if any of you have ever grown up microbiological cultures, it's a 10 to the 11th cell per mil. I mean, that's pretty concentrated. And the bacteria have to be in high concentration to produce the light. And the reason is that they're using quorum sensing to trigger their light. Now, what is quorum sensing? Quorum sensing is the regulation of gene expression in response to cell population densities. So the bacteria release this autoinducer, which is their chemical signal. And that increases in concentration. And they, it goes back and forth over their membrane. The more bacteria there are in the smaller area, the more autoinducer there is, autoinducer there is, the higher concentration it is. And when it re reaches a critical concentration, it triggers the expression of the genes that are responsible for bioluminescence. And in gram negatives like uh, Vibrio, um, homocerine lactones are the autoinducers. But many bacteria, not uh, bioluminescent bacteria, but many bacteria, gram positive, gram negatives, all have um, uh, their version of quorum sensing. It's a little different in different bacteria, but I'm just going to briefly show you the one from Vibrio fisheri. It's a, a little simpler, and actually a little simpler than even Vibrio harvii. And you can't really see it, but there, imagine that there's this little cell membrane here. And these cells actually produce um, the Lux I 
um, gene, which produces the autoinducer, and it diffuses across the membrane, and it's out here outside the cell, and there's some inside the cell. Now, you can imagine if there's a whole bunch of bacteria in, in a high concentration, there's going to be a whole bunch of this autoinducer, and it will react with this regulatory protein within the cell, and that will trigger the transcription and translation of these genes, the Lux genes, which are the genes responsible for bioluminescence. Um, if you've had any kind of genetics or bacterial genetics class, you know that in bacteria, genes for a common function are usually arranged in an operon, and then they're transcribed and translated together. And so these are the genes that make the luciferase and the luciferin and the other proteins that are necessary for this animal to glow. So it produces these proteins, and then it produces light. And so as long as there's a high enough concentration to trigger this reaction, the bacteria will continue to produce light. So in the animal, they've got this specialized organ. The bacteria are really happy. They're living in this high concentration. They're making all their autoinducer, and they're just glowing all the time. And many of the animals have ways of covering up that little photophore, so they don't always want to show it. So a lot of them actually have physical ways of kind of covering up the bioluminescence and then opening it back up so you can see it from the outside. Now, why do they do it? What do they need it for? Well, counterillumination is one way that animals use to evade predators. And they use these photophores to blend in with the light from above. This is a squid, as you can see, and it has these chromophores. You know how squid can change color. So it has those different chromophores, but it also has these little photophores. This is a picture of this squid looking from the bottom up. Now, counterillumination, if you think about it, in the ocean, it's very dark at the bottom. It's very light at the top. So if you're sitting in the water and you look up, it's going to be lighter. Anything that swims in front of you is going to be a dark shadow or a silhouette. So if you're a predator looking for something to eat, you sit there at the bottom, you look up, you see something dark go by, you go up and get it. Now, if you can break up your silhouette or your shadow with a little bioluminescence, then you're going to basically disappear if you do it well enough. And I'm going to show you a video. This was taken with a low-light camera. This is a midshipman fish, and there's going to be two fish in here, and we're going to be looking down from them. They're going to be against a light background. Here's one. Oh, where does he go? He disappears. He turns on his bioluminescence, and he disappears. This one doesn't. And if you're a predator looking up, you see this shadow. Now, if we turn the lights off, we can see that guy is actually still there. He's bioluminescing. He's glowing in the dark. And here again, in case you missed it the first time, see how he disappears? I mean, that works really well. And this poor guy is going to get eaten if he doesn't, he doesn't figure it out pretty soon. Hatchet fish. It's a cute little fish. He has, if you look at him from underneath, he has all these little photophores here that glow. And you can see how that breaks up his little shadow, too, that he could be making if you were looking up from the bottom. And I don't have any pictures of him um, actually bioluminescing. But I just have a picture of him swimming. <laughs> he was so cute. <laughs> I had to put him in. But these are what these little guys look like. And he seems to really like the ROV, because he's actually swimming kind of towards it, towards the big cameras in the front. He's probably swimming towards the light of the cameras. But they're very cute little fish. Here's another way to evade predators, vomit bioluminescence. This shrimp <laughs> is ejecting a bunch of bioluminescence because this big nasty thing is trying to eat him. But also notice, see all these little dots right here? This guy also has bioluminescence. So the predator is also bioluminescing. He has its own evasion techniques as well. Probably one of the more famous fish that you probably have seen in textbooks is the angler fish. And this guy has this uh, glowing barbel that sticks out from the top of his head. And this is bacterial. This is a little pure culture of Vibrio sitting in there. And he uses this thing as a little lure. So he's out fishing. He's trying to get somebody to come and swim up close enough to him so that he can eat them. He actually has a groove right up here in his head. And he can pull that thing back in, and he can cover it up so it doesn't glow anymore. Because there probably are times when he doesn't want things to see him. And then when he's ready to fish again, he kind of opens it up, and that thing pops back out. And then he continues to fish or hunt. There are also um, some fish that use bioluminescence for so-called night vision. As I said before, most, most bioluminescence is blue, because blue-green light travels best in water. Um, and most animals' eyes 
um, can only see the blue light. They really don't have the pigments in their eyes to see red light. And this guy, this, I didn't have a good photograph because he always looks really ratty in photos, so I used this um, illustration. This guy, this is his eye, and he has this red thing here, and he's got this little green bioluminescent thing here. Now this guy is bioluminescing, and he's using a fluorescent pigment to convert his blue light into red light. And it's thought that, well, this guy has additional receptors in his eyes to see red light. So what they think he's doing is they think he's just using it as like a little flashlight. Most animals can't see red light. So if he turns on that red light, they won't see him, but he can see them. And so then he can swim through the water and use his little red light to try to find what he's looking for and then get them when they're not expecting it. And I don't know what that one is doing. I don't know, that's probably up for speculation as to why he has this other little photo for. But this one, we think, since he does have the receptors in his eye to see red light, that that's probably what he's doing. Arena. This is a beautiful siphonophore. Siphonophores are in the phylum Cnidaria. They are gelatinous animals. Um, most people don't know what a siphonophore is. So you guys are gonna be some of the few people to know what siphonophores are. Um, they have stinging cells on their stem, and they, this one in particular catches fish. And we know that because he has a whole bunch of stomachs down here, and if you look in his stomach, you'll find little pieces of fish in it. Um, and here's a nice little uh, drawing of a siphonophore. They have this little float at the end, and he has these little siphons, these swimming bells, and he squeezes water through them, and that propels him through the water. And then he has on his stem, he has a bunch of little stomach pouches, he has a bunch of tentacles, and he has these stinging cells that stick out. Now this guy is interesting because this guy, at the end of these mature tentacles, has this little red thing. And they started looking at it, and they realized that here are the stinging cells, and this guy is a little red fluorescent protein. This thing is like a, it's sort of like a Tootsie Pop. In the center is the bioluminescent material that's making light, and it's surrounded by red uh, fluorescent proteins. And so when he turns on his bioluminescence, you never see the blue, all you see is red. So what is this guy doing? It looks a little suspicious. He's got these little things among his stinging cells. It kind of makes you think that maybe he's looking for something. And here he is. I don't know if you can see this very well. This is taken from the ROV, and here he is. He's swimming along. You can see his um, little siphons that he squeezes to move himself through the water. Here's his stem, and here's his stinging cells right there. You get a little bit closer to his tentacles with his little stinging cells. There's that little red thing right there, the little red Tootsie Pops. And if you look at them under fluorescent light, you can see, yeah, these guys are definitely fluorescent. Now look what this guy does with them. Watch him. He twitches it. This is what he does in real life when you see him out swimming around in the ocean. So he's Jigging for fish is basically what he's doing. He's swimming through, and he's taking that little thing, and he's going, look, look, come and eat this, come and eat this. I've got a little copepod, or I've got a little something that you want to eat. And uh, the poor unsuspecting thing, fish, will swim into his stinging cells. Now, the one interesting thing, if you will recall, I did say that most animals can't see red light. So this is actually a little controversial, because most people say, Fish can't see red light. There are very few fish that can see red light. So how would this work? How could this be a red lure? And that's a good question, and we're not sure. And I think that people need to probably look a little more carefully um, into some of the fish to see if their eyes really can detect more red light than they think. It's difficult because people pull these animals up from the deep sea, and then they, where it's dark, and they take them up into the bright lights. And I think a lot of their visual pigments are kind of messed up when they get exposed to light. Um, but a lot of people definitely think that this guy has got to be fishing with that. I mean, what else could he be doing? This is a really beautiful animal. This is Vampyrotuthus infernalis, which means vampire squid from hell. <laughs> and I know, you know, scientists, they think that they're all boring, you know? They have things like pig butts and vampire squid. I mean, you know, come on. Um, and this guy has a beautiful, beautiful blue eye. He has, under his fins, he has these little photophores that glow. Along on the inside of these arms, he has little photophores. He, he has a photoprotein. He makes his own photoprotein. 
He has um, little photophores inside his arms, and this is actually a picture of his arm. These are the, where the suckers are. The black is where the suckers are, and this is the bioluminescent material. So he bioluminesces all down his arms. He also bioluminesces on his arm tips. So those glow, and they also will kind of squirt out this little bit of sort of milky bioluminescence. So it makes you think that, you know, could this thing, maybe it looks like a big eye, maybe? Why does he have a glowing circle up there? Maybe it looks like an eye. Maybe predators might think, oh, this guy has a big eye. He must be big. Um, I should mention to you that this guy is fairly slow moving. He's not a really fast squid. They also have a display, and I have a little short video clip that I can show you. It doesn't show the bioluminescence, but it shows this guy swimming around. They also will take their arms and completely invert them all the way around themselves. So this whole thing comes backwards, and it's sort of, they think that maybe it's some sort of protection, or maybe it's a display saying, you know, here, I'm going to glow, I'm going to do this, don't I look really scary? But they're also squirting out bioluminescence, so it's, that's got to be probably to evade predators. You know, squirt that bioluminescence out, someone comes to eat you, they get distracted by the, the glowing thing, and then you swim away. But I just love this guy. He's about the size of a football. And it's hard to see in here with the lights, but he's got a really beautiful blue eye. And there's his little glowing thing right there. And this is what he does. And he'll actually pull these all the way around his head. And all you'll see will be the inside of here. And that's where all the bioluminescence is, all along there, and then all along the tips here. It's absolutely a beautiful animal. This is a comb jelly, Baroe. Here's those eight rows of combs, and remember, that's not bioluminescence, right? They're diffracting light. And this guy is a gelatinous animal, so you know he's kind of clear and squishy. Um, this is his mouth, and if you think this is like a cute little guy, he eats things with that mouth, let me tell you. If you collect some of these guys and you put them all in the same container, you come back like an hour later, there'll only be one left, and you can see all the other ones inside of the one. <laughs> We'll be you know, down in the ROV looking at these animals, and you'll find one of these guys. They'll be like a big jellyfish, and he'll be stuck on the side of it, eating part of the jellyfish, a much larger jellyfish. They're actually quite vicious. Um, <laughs> really, they actually, tinafores are big predators. It's just, you know, it's a different world of predation. Nanomia, another siphonophore, similar to the other one. And here's a picture of this guy bioluminescing. Check it out. Just kind of glows all over the place like that. Why is he doing that? Predator evasion, maybe? That's the best we can come up with. He's not visual, so he can't be communicating to other nanomia. We really don't know. And this is the last animal that I'm going to talk about. These are the radiolarians that you're so interested in. So these are protease. These are single-celled animals that live in a colony. And this one has eight. Each one of these is an individual. And they're clonal. If you look at them, they seem to be genetically identical to one another. So they're probably derived um, from the same animal, we imagine. And this sphere is made out of silica. So this is made out of glass. And if you look at it closely, it's this amazing lattice work. I mean, how do they do that? I don't know how they do that. But that's what this sphere is like. And if you press on that sphere, it shatters like glass. It's just absolutely amazing. And this guy here looks very clean because he's been taken up from the deep sea and all of his junk has come off of him. But actually in the ocean they look like this. They have sort of pseudopodia or this ooze that comes out of their little capsules and it kind of oozes out all around them. And then they have these long kind of strands of ooze and they basically float through the water and collect all the debris that's out there. And then they pull it up into their little capsules and they eat it. And these guys kind of bioluminesce all over. If you touch them, they sort of have just kind of this faint little flashy glow all over them. Again, probably to evade predators. Um, because what else could it be? <laughs> Maybe you could come up with some good ideas, too. We're not really sure, but we think that they're probably evading predators. And these are um, some of the animals that I'm trying to work on. And I, what I would really, really like to do is to clone the photoproteins that these guys have. Um, because it would be very interesting, because they're much different than a lot of the other animals. And I imagine the protein sequence is probably much different um, than some of the other ones that we've studied. If you're interested in bioluminescence, Google it. If you Google it, you'll get probably the bioluminescence webpage will be the number one thing that comes up. 
Uh, but there are a lot of good web pages. Edie Witter has some good ones. Um, Ambari, we have some information on our website. And I'd like to briefly acknowledge my laboratory at Ambari and the crew and the ROV pilots of our ships at our ROVs. They're amazing. And that we do get our money from David and Lucille Packard Foundation. And I'm going to leave you with this beautiful <coughs> Tina Four that, by the way, has this red stomach right here, which we think has a red stomach because if it eats things that are bioluminescent and they start glowing, nobody else will see it. So it can basically hide what it eats. <laughs>